Let's use this to move a little bit into the question of tactics. You began this conversation by telling us that the movement developed around 1908, 1909 with an influx or an infusion of younger women. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the tactics used by the older generation, and I'm not talking now about the Stanton Anthony generation, but about the successes. So Carrie Chapman Catt, for example, who's heading up the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And by 1912, of course, we have first the Congressional Union and then the National Women's Party, whose constituents are not entirely, but largely younger women. Are there differences in the tactics they adopt? Is there a change that happens when the new women come in? Well, I think the big thing is taking it to the streets. <laughs> the younger generation is hell-bent on taking it to the streets, by which I mean that they are staging, there's a street corner demonstration in 1908 in Madison Square that is probably the first in New York City um, in this generation. Those are younger women and I've said um, that the parades on Fifth Avenue become pageants, spectacles. It's such an interesting art form because it looks like it's a celebration of something. Um, those massive 30,000 marchers, bands, banners, women from all over the world. In some cases, you know, German women have the right to vote, Japanese, why don't we? That kind of um, advertising. It's all about public relations. It's about persuasion. It's about getting the public on the side of women's suffrage. Um, and there were many women, Carrie Chapman Catt was the most vocal about it, who not only thought it was a horrible thing to do, but they were supported by a lot of very prim people who would write notes to the New York Times saying things like, why are these women parading themselves on Fifth Avenue? And you could see their ankles and all that sort of rot <laughs> about um, the female body being visible, which is breaking a taboo at this time. And the suffragists totally embrace this public spectacle um, on a scale that their elders disproved of almost until the very end. The first time Carrie Chapman Catt actually approved of a march, I think was 1917, might have been 1916, but that's the end of the story. <laughs> but where did the young people come up with this idea of taking it to the street or of active demonstrative protests? Well, they saw it in, in England. Um, a lot of them learned. In England? Yes, from Emmeline Pankhurst. If you've seen the film Suffragette, <laughs> you see women in public demonstrating. Um, Alice Paul came from London. Uh, Lucy Burns came from London. Inez Milholland, who some people might remember because she rides a white horse beautifully in a march in Washington on behalf of suffrage. All those kinds of women had seen the British women doing street demonstrations, so that's part of it. And of course, there had been labor demonstrations in the streets for years. And that was the same. And speech, speechifying and standing on the benches in Union Square, all these things took great advantage of the landscape of the city of New York. So the demonstrations sort of reach their peak after 1912 when Alice, Byrne, when Alice Paul and Lucy Burns come back from England. Uh, and then, of course, 1914, a war breaks out in Europe and there's a kind of war spirit, even though the U.S. doesn't enter the war for three years after that. Do the tactics change when the war begins? Do the women decide to consolidate their energies and support the men? Some do, some don't, like everything else we've been talking about. that It's very hard to, uh, there are many generalizations about the suffrage movement, but I think they're all wrong because there's such generalizations. Some do, some don't. 
some women, because they're political um, in general, they're politically minded, they're political activists, some women are pacifists. They're quite, New York is a hotbed of pacifist resistance to the war. It's also a hotbed <laughs> of people who are gung-ho <laughs> to support the war. 1914 is a little early. As it gets closer to the U.S. entry into the war, these differences really start to tear apart the suffrage movement. And Carrie Chapman Catt, who was one of the founders of the Women's Peace Party, makes a pragmatic decision to give the suffrage army to the war effort, in short, um, to devote, to support the war and to devote suffrage workers to war work as we get closer to 1917. And so in fact, in 1917, which is when the victory came in New York, the November 1917 referendum passed the yes votes were higher than the no votes. The New York City votes were higher than the upstate votes. It was New York City, particularly the black and Jewish districts in New York City that carried the yays so that we New York women have the right to vote. Um, it was a direct outgrowth, I think, of, um, or certainly it was a big factor in this great victory was the fact that Carrie Chapman Catt and the National Organization endorsed the war. Would I be correct if I said that the, that the national vote, now we know that New York City women already have the vote, but the national vote, well, let me rephrase that. Would I be correct if I said that Woodrow Wilson uh, and much of the Congress were turned around by the fact that Carrie Chapman Cap and the National American Women's Suffrage Association actually pitched in to support the war rather than uh, that they were alienated by the Alice Paul tactics. So it was the tactics of acquiescence and being good women, if you like, versus the tactics of being bad women or disruptive women no. that actually got no. the vote. No. no. I would good. hate to think that. Absolutely not. First of all, things are cumulative, right? This is not one action causes the 19th Amendment <laughs> to be passed, but no. <laughs> There's a long history. We're talking about a steady erosion of any prejudice against women voting, or prejudice against women, um, has been eroding through all these years. It's taken a very long time to convince the men who make the decisions in our government that women are responsible citizens um, and should have the right to exercise the ballot. So there's that. There's the whole history. Public opinion had really changed by 1917 and 18 um, in favor of women's suffrage in most places in the world. Um, there were states where women had been voting for years. Um, remember that there were two different roads, I'm sure you've talked about this, to winning the vote, and one was the state by state road and already had swept up Montana and the states in the West and Jeanette Rankin had been elected to Congress from Montana by this time. So I don't think that endorsing the war was the factor and it certainly, it, it reeks of not so much good girlness as um, patriotism. Mm. That's what Carrie Chat. Cat called it was patriotism. And in a time when people were worried, we we're about to have a huge crackdown on subversives and the Red Scare and the Palmer Raids and, and all the um, fear of terrorism actually in the country to embrace patriotism, which is what she did as a tactic, I don't think her heart changed, <laughs> as a tactic certainly was the last thing that made the difference, but popular opinion 
had been growing on the side of women's suffrage.